Good morning to you. It is the first Sunday, December the 5th, 2021. We've made it to the last month of the year, but the first Sunday in the last month. And we're about to get ready for our Sunday school lesson, which is going, it's going to begin promptly at 9.30 a.m. I don't know why I had to look at my clock to remember that. But uh, as we normally do, we come on just a bit early, just to give us an opportunity uh, to greet one another, to say good morning, to say hello. That way we don't just abruptly rush into teaching God's word and to learning the Sunday school lesson uh, this morning. Uh, for those that don't know me, my name is Rodney Smith Sr. and I'm the pastor of New Hebron Missionary Baptist Church where God has blessed me to be for over 14 years now. I want to encourage all of you to get your books as I make some technical adjustments here. There we go. To go ahead and get your Sunday school books if you have your new books. If not, please feel free to get your Bible. And we're going to be in Matthew chapter 1. And we're also going to be in John chapter 12. Make sure I have my Bible placed here. Uh, I just want to remind you that because of the volume of reading that would be required to read all of the text sometimes, uh, I've opted away from, I've chosen not to kind of read the text. So I, w I hope that all of you have your Bible, your Sunday school book, and you follow along with us. Uh, if you're looking at this and uh, watching the stream at a later date, it will certainly be beneficial to you to make sure that you have your Bible and follow along with us. That is if you're able. I do understand that because many of us are at home or possibly on the go, there's a lot of multitasking that goes on. If you're able to pull away from that, it would just help you with your understanding uh, giving more attention to God, more attention to his word. And we're just praying that you can follow along with us in the text. And like I said, I won't be reading every verse, but uh, I will be going over them kind of bit by bit. So good morning to you, to the Tim's family, uh, to the Waller family, uh, Brother Alfonso Brown, good morning to you, to Deacon and Sister Davis. God bless you, to my Aunt Rosanna, good morning, good to have you with us again. I've got my Maxwell House coffee. I've got my water here in front of me. I've got my laptop, my pen, my highlighter, my Bible, my Sunday school book. I've got my communion packages for uh, the 11 o'clock worship or 1045 worship, at the end of which we will be having communion. So I kind of have a whole lot of stuff here in front of me. And as I'm going through the lesson and teaching God's word, if someone types in a question or a long response, please forgive me if I do not respond to it. It is difficult to look at the camera, read the screen, and, and maneuver through all of this landscape I have here in front of me. So I'm doing the best I can. Sometime when I go back to listen to the lesson to make sure I said what I was intending to say the proper way, sometimes I see messages that I just overlooked. And I'm like, oh, Lord, I hope I didn't offend or make someone feel neglected or cast to the side because that's certainly not the case but just wanted to give you that disclaimer again uh, let me encourage you to the members of New Hebron to still continue to uh, honor God and support New Hebron with your giving and I want to thank you right now for all of you who are here and even the ones that may be watching this down the road we appreciate your support with your presence we're just taking the time out to learn God's word along with us and choosing this local congregation to be the source of some of that learning. Hopefully that what we say and what we do can be a benefit to you spiritually and that it can give you the, I guess, uh, the ability to get closer to God by learning more about him through his word. Uh, Sister Verdi Davis, good morning. Uh, Sister Shawan Avon, good morning to you. I'm going to go ahead and get started with this. I got a peaceful rest last night, an early morning rise. I was able to get up, have a nice, healthy breakfast, had my, my turkey sausage and scrambled eggs, had me some good cold water. I'll take some of that good water right now. Had my coffee set to kick on at 7 o'clock, and I was awakened by the smell of fresh brewing coffee. So I, I'm, I'm kind of in a good place right now. Uh, felt good. 
uh, one thing that I try to avoid doing whenever possibly possible is rushing into teaching or rushing into preaching or rushing into worship if I'm going to attend. I like the smooth, steady approach. I don't like rushing into it kind of disheveled and not quite, you know, prepared in that way where my wits aren't quite about me. And so for those of you who may be taking the opportunity to still lay in bed or lay on your side, uh, let me encourage you to sit up if possible. Uh, to give God just that little bit more energy because it's going to be very easy for you to lay there to listen and listening turns into closing my eyes and closing your eyes may turn into a bit of a cat nap during God's word. And that's not for my ego. That's not for any personal reason. It's just so that we as God's people can give God our full attention. So amen. I appreciate you in advance for that. Uh, Sister Clark, good morning to you. God bless you as well. Uh, we've made it to 930, so to be respectful of everyone's time, we're going to go ahead and get started. We're going to have a word of prayer. Uh, for those of you who are able to pause for a moment, let's pause, let's pray together before we go into God's word. So let's take that time to pray. Lord, thank you uh, for all that you've done. Thank you for being the head of all of our lives. Thank you for controlling the circumstances of this world and even the circumstances of our individual little personal situations. Even though at times things do get rough, they can get difficult, we still know that you're seated on your throne and you're still in charge. It's hard sometimes, Father, to look past the current situation we're in when it's difficult to still see your hand working. But we trust and know that what your word says is true. That when Isaiah saw you, in that vision he had when you called him, he said you were still seated upon your throne and your throne was high and lifted up. This morning, Father, we come humbly before you, but yet still boldly. We ask you for an understanding heart and mind. Help us not just to see your word, but to have insight into your word. Help us, Father, to have a right understanding and to use that to apply to our hearts that we can live a life that you would be pleased with. Forgive us of our shortcomings, our failings, our flaws, our sin, the things we've done intentionally, the things we've even done accidentally. Cleanse us, Father, and help us, Father, to have a fresh and a new lease on life. As we go through your word, we pray that we can hold on to your hand. I pray that you can use me as only you can to give your name honor and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Good morning to you, Sister Lucretia Brown coming in with us. Uh, if you have your new Sunday school book, we're going to be, as I said, in Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 to 21. And yes, because we're in December, you do understand the cycle of the Sunday school lesson. We're talking about the birth of Christ because that is what Christmas is about. We're also going to be in John chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. And we're going to look at a situation to where, you know, one of the disciples tried to uh, uh, give a pretext, a cover for wicked motivation because he was a thief. The unit that we are in is entitled Jesus' Triumphant Arrival. The lesson this morning is entitled Sorrow Before Triumph. Sorrow Before Triumph. So uh, once again, we're, we're in Matthew chapter 1. And just for these four verses, I'm going to read these because this is pretty brief and many of us may be familiar with this. Beginning at verse 18, it says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on the wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily or privately. But while she thought, he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take Mary unto you, uh, Mary, uh, fear not to take unto you Mary, your wife, for that she is, what is, which is conceived in her womb is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son and you shall call his name Jesus for he shall save his people from 
their sins. Not from his sins, he has none, but from their sins. And of course, this is the lesson that oftentimes our Sunday school uh, lesson units will kind of curve and circle around to because we're in December and most notably, you know, we celebrate the birth of Christ on the 25th, which is in uh, December. So we want to kind of give some good information. Uh, one thing I did learn, I compared my regular print Sunday school book to a large print Sunday school book. And the page numbers, the page I'm on is going to be different than the page the adult book is on. So as I'm saying, left-hand column, right-hand column, that's only from the regular print Sunday school book, not from the large print. It may be found when I read certain sections, it may be found in a different location. Uh, but verse one, uh, verse 18 of chapter 1, the lesson calls it Mary's condition. Verses 19 to 21 is Joseph's dilemma. And Mary's condition was, that, well, she was pregnant. Uh, she was espoused. She was engaged to a man. Uh, and she came up uh, to not have a child. And so I want to read from our lesson. Uh, first of all, in the book of Matthew, it gives the genealogy of Christ through the lineage of David. Uh, Matthew, uh, who is a Jew, a tax collector, he was hated at one time. But Matthew is a Jew writing to a Jewish audience. And because Matthew was writing to a Jewish audience, he carries the lineage through the son of David, who was the son of Abraham as well. He shows the Jewish lineage that Christ has. That's why the lineage in Matthew would be different from, I believe it's in Luke. But the reason Matthew does that is for what I just stated, because he's writing to a Jewish audience. Now, we have to understand in verse 18, it says, when Mary, his mother, was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Now, Joseph, of course, in the text that we're in now, the verse, he had no idea about this. But our lesson kind of puts a very good understanding on the espousal or the betrothal or the engagement period of a Jewish marriage. It says betrothal, uh, betrothal in the New Testament Jewish culture was a legal arrangement made about one year before the actual marriage ceremony and the consumption, uh, consummation, excuse me, of the marriage. To remove oneself from such an arrangement required a legal divorce. So this kind of puts us in context of their culture. The engagement was just as binding as a marriage. Their commitment was just, was just as serious as a marriage. That's why you read how Joseph want to put her away or to divorce her, but he wanted to do it privately. Now, we have to look at verse 18 here. Moses, excuse me, <laughs> Moses, Mary is pregnant with Christ. Joseph, who is her engaged, uh, her engaged husband, her husband, fiance, we would say, he found out, he came to know by one way or another, maybe she began showing, but he finds out that my fiance is pregnant. I have not been intimate with her. So apparently there must be another person involved. And for him, Joseph said, listen, I don't want to have anything to do with this. But when you get to verse 19, it, give, it, it even refers to him in verse 19 as her husband. They have not had the wedding as of yet. They have not consummated the marriage as of yet. Another reference to show just how binding the betrothal or the engagement was in their culture. So he wanted, he was, re, he's referring to her at, referred to as her husband. But it says Joseph being a just man, he doesn't want to make a public spectacle of her. He wants to divorce her or to put her away privately, secretly, so it does not bring any shame to her name. Now, let's put this in context. Joseph, a righteous man, a just man, he's undoubtedly hurt because the woman he's about to marry well, obviously for her to have a child, she's been intimate with someone else. She has 
been unfaithful to me and that unfaithfulness, the fruit of that is she's conceived a child with somebody else. So of course he's hurt. Of course, there's a certain degree of anger, a feeling of betrayal. He's been faithful and loyal to someone who at least it appears has not been faithful and loyal to him. Now in our mindset, and not so much a Jewish mindset, but just as humans, how do people act? How do people react when they feel they've been wronged? How would somebody respond to that act of unfaithfulness today? They're picking out tuxedos. They're picking out a venue. They're picking out a wedding dress. She has the engagement ring. Making arrangements for family to come into town and hotel plans and how much this will cost and where we're going to live and all these decisions being made. And in the midst of that, she's pregnant and the child isn't yours. How would a person react to that today? How do people act when they're angry would be a better question. You see, when this situation, if it were to hit today, we've seen it. Maybe random people on the internet and social media, they air out who they feel to be the guilty partner, the offending partner, the unfaithful spouse, unfaithful fiance, whomever he or she may be. They're going to go down a list, many people, of what they are and what they aren't. And I can't stand you this. You see, there's an old Pine Bluff proverb. Many of us have heard this before. This old Pine Bluff proverb. There are three people who are going to tell you the truth. A child, an alcoholic, and a mad person. Woo! A child in their innocence, they don't know these social norms of trying to be kind and to phrase things a certain way. They're going to say this is nasty. It doesn't, it doesn't matter that it's a favorite recipe that everyone likes. A child will say, oh, this is nasty. A person who's inebriated. You see, they end up saying when they're drunk what they were thinking when they're sober. But, oh, an angry person, when a person is hurt, offended, and they're angry, guess what they're going to do? I'm going to tell you now what I really think about your mama. I'm going to tell you now what I really think about your daddy. I'm going to tell you now what I think about that old ugly dress or that ugly pair of jeans you keep putting on. I'm going to tell you now what I think about your wig or what I think about your haircut, what I think about how your physique really is. You really ain't built like I've been telling you. You're really flabby, this, that, and the other. You, you. When a person's angry, look at how they throw stuff out there. But in his hurt, in his anger, it is still, I'm going to say, governed. It is still guided by the fact that he's a follower of Christ. I say Christ of the Lord. Christ is not born. He's a believer. He is a righteous man. He is a just man. And even though from his perspective, he has no knowledge about the way the child was conceived. The only way he thinks a child can be conceived is the way child children have always been conceived. The way that you and I would ever think a child would be conceived. She's been unfaithful to me. But in the midst of that, being a just man, he doesn't want to embarrass her. Notice, she, from his perspective, has hurt him, has embarrassed him, has offended him, has been unfaithful to him, has been disloyal to him. But yet in turn, she does that to him, at least from his perspective, but he doesn't want to do that to her. He even goes the extra mile. I don't want to make a public spectacle of her. I'd rather separate from her because obviously she's been unfaithful. But let's do it privately. Let's not make a social media post about this. Let's not go to the break room and run our mouths. I'm not going to do it. Certainly she won't either, but I'm not going to run to the break room and tell everybody in there my little personal business. There's something to be said about restraint. The Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, one of the manifestations of a spirit-filled life is something called temperance. Yes, yes, I know depending on the circumstance and what's going on, it can require a lot more temperance than other situations. This one, I would say, would be high on the list. But people, when you're frustrated, when you're upset, when you find yourself the offended party at the hands of what somebody else has done, make sure that even though you're angry, your anger is still governed by a spirit-filled life. 
Your anger is still governed by a spirit-filled uh, walk with the Lord. Because I've seen the unfortunate situation of a beautiful beginning and a tragic ending. And I'm sure many of us out there have too. Oh, haven't you ever seen that loving courtship? He opens the door for her. He spends a lot of money on dinner. She's kind and might make a meal. And she laughs at his little corny jokes and tells him how strong he is and how handsome he is. And he'll open the car door and make sure she's seated and close the car door nicely and cuts the grass before she wakes up, washes and waxes her car, cleans the inside, cleans the windows. I mean, he does all these wonderful things. And this beautiful courtship turns into a marriage. Haven't you ever heard those wedding vows and people who give these wedding vows where they write their own vows and our love is the greatest love they ever did. Love, love, love. Before love became love, it was us and love this and pouring sand together and the same way the sand mixes together is how our lives are going to mix together in the beginning. But when it falls apart, all this door opening. All this love, that's the greatest love they ever did. Love, the love, love before love was. And all this nice laughing at the jokes and the compliments. Oh, that's gone. Now you have two people who at one time pledged their love and faithfulness to each other before God. And all of these witnesses in front of a preacher, probably at some church, in front of somebody's pulpit and altar. Now those two people are trying to tear each other down. He ain't this, she ain't that, he ain't this, she ain't that. But look at how Joseph is acting. He feels, rightfully so, because he has a limited amount of information. He feels he's been slighted. He feels, I've been faithful to someone who hasn't been faithful to me. Hurtful feeling. Whether it's a marriage or a friendship or even just a casual relationship, I've been kind to someone and nice to someone and come to find out they've been selling me out the whole time. I've told them confidential things. I've shared my history. I've shared my fears, my goal, my past, my ambition, and come to find out there's somebody else. I was one of many. And the fruit of that Action has been now she's pregnant. And here you have Joseph just in verse 19. He wants to put her away privately. He doesn't want to make a public example of her. In the midst of his hurt, in the midst of his pain, in the midst of his feeling of betrayal, he still does the right thing. The point we can all arrive at people is that, listen to me, the situation is not supposed to dictate how you respond. What someone does is not to dictate what you do to them if you do anything in return. These things are dictated by what God says in his word. Your character does not depend on the pendulum of what their character is, good, bad, or indifferent. No matter what they do, you're only responsible for yourself. No matter what they say, you're only responsible responsible for yourself because life is 10% what happens to you and 90% how you deal with it. So how you deal with it, if you want to have a verse 19 Joseph experience, you better make sure you have your spiritual boots strapped on tight. And I do understand depending on what it is, the nature of the offense, the extent of the offense, that can be hard. I'm not saying that's easy in every situation, especially when you are in the midst of making a lifelong commitment to someone and you think everything is perfect and you're blindsided with this news to let you know everything is not perfect. In verse 20, these first words, while he thought on these things, while he kind of molded over in his mind, he didn't have a hair trigger. He didn't have a knee jerk reaction. He didn't let his emotions get high and his intellect get low. He didn't let his passion get high and his character get low. He molded over while he thought on these things. Guess what happened? The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. And the angel of the Lord gave him insight into a situation that he had no prior knowledge to. He said, the angel of the Lord, Joseph, 
thou son of David, from the lineage of David, you are a Jew. Fear not to take Mary to be your wife. Don't, don't, don't worry about the critics. Don't worry about the skeptics. Don't think you're making a bad decision by staying with her because you should. Let me tell you why you should stay with Mary. Because Mary has not been unfaithful. Mary has not been disloyal. Mary has not been, she has not betrayed your trust, betrayed your love. She hasn't broken your heart. She does have a child, that's true. But the child was not conceived by another man. The child was conceived by the Holy Ghost. Now, there, 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 there's one technical thing I'm going to bring out, kind of a far-reaching truth to apply to another, uh, a, a, a heresy of the day. But I want to keep it kind of close to home first. You see, Mary did not have a miraculous birth. Mm -mm. Mary experienced a miraculous conception. You see, when you want to know the father of a child, you check the blood of the father against the blood of the child. That's how you, that's, that's what Maury Povich does, made a living of it. You are not the father. We check the child's DNA, we check yours, it's not a match. So she's been with somebody else, that's not your child. This right here lets us know that Jesus did not have a drop of Joseph's blood in his vein. Because if he did, he would be susceptible to the same sin nature that all of us have, myself included. He would be susceptible to the same sin nature of every other person who was born. He would then be unfit and unqualified to be the spotless lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Why? He would be a sinner just like you and I. But because he was not conceived by man, by Joseph, he was conceived by the Holy Ghost and he didn't have a drop of Joseph's blood in his vein. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit. He is now fit. He is qualified to be the savior of the world. He is sinless. He is perfect in all of his ways, in all of his attributes, in all of his motivations, in all of his behavior, in all of his yes, his no, his stance for something, his stance against something, he is perfect. This is the God man, God in human form. He, this is what's called, and you may have heard this term from me before, the hypostatic union. He's 100% God as if he never was man, while at the same time, he's 100% man as if he never was God. The perfect union of the two. He is our savior. And you notice that Joseph is the son of David from the lineage of David, from the lineage of Abraham. Joseph is Jewish. Mary, we can see in another uh, uh, gospel Mary takes the turtle dove. That's the Jewish tradition. Mary is Jewish. Jesus, and I hate to state the obvious, he's Jewish. People, he's a Jew, not African-American. He's a Jew. He's not African from Africa. He's a Jew. Jesus ain't black. He's Jewish. I don't know how dark or how fair complected he was. I have no idea. Jesus is Jewish. He is a Jewish man. He has a Jewish mother. Now, of course, Joseph is his earthly father. But you see some of the fallacies that people pick up and run with of the day. But the main point I wanted to, to display was that, listen, Jesus is the Savior of the world, and he is fit to be that. And even the angel tells Joseph, He's going to be a boy, <laughs> all right? Here's what you need to call him, Jesus. The Old Testament equivalent of Jesus, I believe it's Joseph. Uh, it was in our Sunday school lesson here. I read that. And the reason he shall be called Jesus is because he shall save his people from, not his sins, but from their sins. 
which even substantiates the fact that no matter how nicely dressed, how well manicured you and I can be, how many Christian songs and how much Christian protocol we are familiar with and how much Bible scripture we know and how big our Bible is on the coffee table, we all have a sin nature. Jesus does not. And it is Christ who died. And when we put our faith in him, doesn't mean that we will be sinless. Don't fool yourself. But it does mean that through Christ, through growth, over time, we're not sinless. But we do sin less. And we sin less. And we sin a little bit less and less. There should be a decreasing pattern of sin in our lives. And that's not even our own human effort. That's us putting our faith in a Savior that shed his blood to save us from our sins. And so we can see the account in Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 to 21. And our lesson, once again, is entitled Sorrow Before Triumph. Now turn to John chapter 12. John chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. Beautiful verse. Because in this uh, verses in this passage that we have here, it kind of gives us the scene, the time stamp. You know how sometimes when you take a picture and you go back to it and you can press a button, it'll show you the exact date and time that picture was taken. You can look on your phone. It used to be cameras, you know, the, the, the fancy cameras, you know, when you get your pictures developed, <laughs> they would have at the bottom corner the date and time when you took that picture. The, the date and the time stamp is in John chapter 12, verse number one. This is six days before the Passover. Jesus came to a village right outside of Jerusalem called Bethany. And Lazarus, which had been dead, he was there and who he was, who had been raised from the dead. Now you got to imagine this scene. Jesus is in this home. He's in Bethany. The same place where Mary and Martha and Lazarus were. John chapter 11. And Lazarus had been dead for four days. His body was thinking, decomposing. And Jesus said, show me where you laid him. And he said, Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus came out of the grave. And he said, take the grave clothes off of him. He had life, but he didn't have liberty. Almost a beautiful symbol and picture of a new Christian. You once were dead in your trespasses and sin. Now you've been raised from them. That's salvation. You got life. Well, now you got to take off the grave clothes, the old way of talking to people, the old way of handling anger, the old way of handling money, the old way of being a husband or a wife, the old way of being a child, the old way of living as a man or as a woman, the old way you used to get stuff done when you didn't have money, you used to cut corners, but now you got liberty in Christ whom the son has set free is free indeed. And Lazarus is here having a meal. He's alive. You can imagine the sisters were excited. You can imagine that Mary and Martha, who had been to his funeral, who had seen the casket close slowly, as our tradition is in many of our churches, who had heard them sing some of those familiar songs at a funeral, going up yonder, I mean, just whatever it may be, you know, all these songs, and now that person the brother who they love so much, he ain't just alive. They having a meal with him. And there's Lazarus. He just going along and get along. He just enjoying himself too. And that's verse one. They made him a supper. Martha served, but Lazarus, verse two, was one of them that sat at the table with him. Now, let me tell you something about Lazarus. If that were you and I, and I'm going to bring it home here. When you were dead, and you know you were dead. You were sick and you couldn't get well. They sent word for Jesus and the last thing you knew was that your eyes closed never to be opened again. And something got to stir it in you. You got up out of that tomb. You walked forth with those grave clothes on that they would wrap you in. And you realize this man Jesus has brought you back to life. You can't separate Lazarus from Jesus' side. He, could, he has a testimony, which is this. You can't make me doubt him. Mm -mm. 
because I know too much about it. I know what he did for me. If anybody knows who Jesus really is, if anybody is going to be devoted to Christ, it's going to be Lazarus. Because Lazarus can say, I'm not what I should be. But because of that man, Jesus, I'm sure not what I used to be. Friend, that should be the testimony of every Christian. If anybody knows what it's like to be dead in trespasses and sin and to stumble your way some in front of somebody's church and to hear some little broken preacher preach the gospel and something click in your heart and you realize if I died this way, I would have no choice of any way going to heaven. But because of what Jesus did, now he paid for my salvation and I believe that Jesus is my savior and you repent of your sins and you now have new life in Christ. If there's anybody that ought to have a devotion, a zeal, a sacrificial spirit, a bond, a connection to the Lord, shouldn't it be his people who he raised symbolically from the dead? Shouldn't we be like a Lazarus, every Christian? When you realize what you used to do, where you used to go, when you realize what you used to get into, how you used to handle this, the stuff that you never told your spouse, the stuff you never told your kids, the stuff you never told mom and daddy, when you realize all that you've been through and this Jesus pulled me from that and got me on a stream on a Sunday morning at 10, 15 in the morning. There'd have been a time some of us had just been getting home a few hours ago. But this Jesus has changed me. Shouldn't we be devoted to him? You can imagine Lazarus is devoted to him. And then even after he's given us new life, he said, you know what? I know enough about you to know that you're still going to mess up. So when you mess up, I'm giving you this easy button. You seen the little red easy buttons? What? Well, what's that for? It's called repentance. Call on me. I'm not giving you a license to sin. Mm -mm. And because I love you, I'll still spank you behind sometime. But when you hit the easy button, when you fall on your knees and repent, and say, Father, I'm sorry, what was I thinking? What was I doing? Why did I do that? Lord, I knew better. I shouldn't have done that. He can take it and wipe your slate clean. Friends, what a mighty God we serve. And here you got Lazarus. I can imagine that's his testimony. What a mighty God we serve. He's sitting there just eating, probably can't even taste the food, just looking at Jesus the whole time. Lord, have mercy. Thank you, Lord. Then it goes on. Then Mary... I'm going to go a bit more through these verses. Took a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the ointment. I want to read kind of what the uh, lesson says to us. It's under the extravagant devotion, verses John 12, verses 2 and 3. In the midst, on, in my book, at the bottom of the page, page 7, it says, spikenard is a perfume derived from a plant that grows only in the Himalayan mountains of India, Nepal, and China. And it says, even if Mary belonged to a wealthy family, this would have represented a very extravagant gesture of devotion to Jesus. Listen, this ointment was costly. And in her heart, it's worth it to give it to Jesus. Then says one of his disciples, as she cracks open the box and anoints his head. And when you compare the other gospel accounts, she anoints his feet and his head and she wipes it with her hair. Judas, verse four, the Judas who was Simon's son that should betray him. What a bad tag to have on your name. Judas, there's, there's a lot of people named Luke, Matthew, Peter, Paul, Mary, Martha. You never find a person named Judas, do you? Because this Judas is the one that would betray Jesus. Judas does in verse 5 and verse 6, he performs what is called a pretext. A pretext is when somebody gives a cover story that looks good to hide their true intentions because they're bad. Judas said, wait a minute. This is enough ointment, verse 5. This is enough ointment that we can sell it for 300 pence. The Greek word for pence is denarii. A denarii is a day's wage. 
This ointment is so precious, so costly, we can sell it for 300 days worth of work. This is basically a year's salary that we could use and we could put it in the bag. Oh, excuse me. Give it to the poor. See, that, that's the pretext. How do we know it's the pretext? How do we know he's lying? Because verse six says it. He said this in verse six, not because he cares for the poor. He could care less for the people at Asher and University. I know they're trying to change the name of Asher to Colonel Glenn. That's Asher. Asher and University. He could care less about the people at the intersection saying, can you help me with anything? He could care less, could care less about the poor. He said this because he was a thief and he was the one that had the bag. He was the treasurer. He held the bag of their funds and bare what was put therein. He had care of the money. Judas's real intention was not to sell the money, give it to the poor, and it would be more beneficial than just wasting it. I mean, I love you, Jesus, but on his feet. His intention was not to give to the poor. He could care less about the poor. His intention was we can sell this money, a year's wage, we can put it in the account, and I can have more money to steal. You see what I'm saying? Let's, let's just break this down. People, principle number one, when you have to lie about your actions, that's a sign, proof positive, that you know what you're doing is wrong. Why? You're lying because you know what you are doing is wrong. You know it. That I, I, I would say that to my kids all the time. Now, see, why are you lying? You're lying because you know you did wrong. Now, see, were you on the phone when I said don't be on the phone? No. And sometimes I would take the lawyer approach. I'd be like, now, listen, now, let's discuss this. First of all, I know when you're on the phone. Second of all, I heard you on the phone. Third of all, don't forget, I saw you on the phone. So why would you try, you try to lie and say you weren't doing what I knew, heard, and saw you doing? The reason you're lying is because you know what you did is wrong, and you're hoping there's some way I can get out of this with a lie, a pretext. Listen, and the sad part is we have too many people that, that are not men and women of their word. They say they're going to help you move. Oh, yeah, I'll help you. Call me. Oh, they'll, they'll go out the way. Call me, man. Get, man, call me. Call, man, please, call me. Please, call me. Oh, 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 you sure? No, man, listen, I love you. I want to help you, brother. Call me. And then when you call them, you can tell when it goes to voicemail, it ring like one and a half times. Like, eh. I'm like, oh, Lord, okay. And then you'd be like, man, was yesterday the day that y'all moved? Oh, man, I forgot all about it. Really? Y'all moved yesterday? See, I was at my auntie's house down in Wabaseka. I had to help her out, man. She had a heart surgery. You know, you know, man, I'm just being a good guy. They'll make up some story. The real intent was they lied in the first place. They had no true intention of coming to help you move. They, they can, they'll use a cover story to hide the true intent. That's what Judas is doing. That, listen, how many people have stood up in church meetings objected to something that the deacon was saying and they objected to what the deacon was saying not because of the reason they gave they objected to what the deacon was saying because they mad at him why are they mad at him because he teach sunday school and i think last week in the lesson he was talking about me but i don't have enough courage to ask him I'm just going to believe it, even though I got no proof. So my real reason for objecting to what Deacon so-and-so was saying has got nothing to do with what I'm saying. My real reason for objecting is a whole nother issue. We have a way of describing that. That's called a lie. So what is Judas, Judas doing? Lying. But he says, listen, he tries to give some religious facade. He tries to give some spiritual cover. He tries to give some righteous, pious reason for objecting to wasting it on Jesus. Number one, he don't love Jesus. Number two, he ain't studying the poor either. He just really wants this money so he can have it in his bag. And in the bag, he can embezzle more money for personal use. And then the killing part is verse six explains his true intention. 
Not only does the Holy Spirit give this information to John as he writes the gospel according to John. Don't you know that Jesus, who's all-knowing, is able to see through the pretext, the lies, the falsehood of what Judas is saying? He should have understood that at the end of Jesus' ministry, when he was at the Garden of Gethsemane, and he told him, the one I kissed, that's the Savior. And when he hugged Jesus and kissed him, Jesus said, do you think you can betray the Son of Man with a kiss? He should have understood this from Mark chapter 2 when they tore a hole in the roof and Jesus said to the man that was paralyzed, thy sins be forgiven thee, and his enemies were right there in the front row. Yes, wicked people come to church too, and they were thinking in their hearts, who can forgive sins but God? This man ain't God. That's blasphemy. But what they were thinking inwardly, Mark chapter 2 says, Jesus answered openly. He said, because you don't believe I am who I said I am. Take up your bed and walk. Not only can I forgive sins, I can heal his body. Judas was right there. He should have known that when I make this statement, that's an obvious lie. Jesus, he does know. He does have insight into my heart. He knows what I'm truly thinking, what I'm truly doing. Let that be a lesson to anyone who is bogged down with the weight of constantly lying, constantly making up stories that you know ain't true and half the time aren't even believable. There is a man that sits high and looks low and he knows when you're lying. He knows when you're lying to your mama. He knows when you're lying to your spouse. He knows when you're lying to your family. He knows when you're lying at work. He knows when you're lying to your kids. The Half the time, people you're lying to know you're lying to them. But if we can figure it out and we're human, surely the God that we serve that sits high and looks low, he certainly knows when you're lying. He knows what's in our heart. He knows when we really mean that we're going to do for him. He knows if you are truly, truly sorry for what you've done. Or are you just saying you're sorry for what you've done because you got caught doing what you've been doing? He knows if it's true repentance or if it's just, I feel guilty. He knows if you're really working because you need to work and you desire to help people or if it's some form of penitence. You see, I did three things bad yesterday. I'm going to do 10 things good today. So my good outweigh my bad. We don't have a works-based religion. We don't have a works-based salvation. Jesus knows the true intent of what's on our heart. And in verse 6, God knew. Jesus knew. He could care less for the poor. So what does Jesus do? Not only does he defend the poor, not only does he defend Mary, he also substantiates that what is being done is needed, necessary, and relevant. Then Jesus said these words in verse 7, leave her alone. Now, I can have a good time with that, y'all. Oh, Lord, have mercy. When these hellhounds get on your track, when these folks get to calling you, calling you out your name, when the people at work seem to crowd up against you and trying to get rid of you and you doing what you're supposed to do, when your enemies are all around you, there is somebody that can come to the front of your ship and say, leave them alone. Jesus will defend you. I know that for myself. There's a myriad of testimonies I can give you. And you know what? I'm not foolish enough to think I'm the only one. I bet there's somebody out there that can say, Jesus will stand for you. Brother Mitchell, I, Brother Mitchell won't he do it? I was just finna say your name. He'll stand for you. When all these people who got positions and authority and power and they up the corporate ladder and you not up the corporate ladder and you seem defenseless, you feel helpless, you want to fight, you want to fuss, but you want to do stuff the right way. Lord, I'm trying to hold my tongue. I ain't trying to get fired, but I ain't going to let these folk railroad me. He can stand up and turn the tables around. Even to the point to where one of my favorite verses in the 23rd number of Psalms, he'll prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemy. He said, you know what? While they're trying to hurt you and bring you down, guess what I'll do? I'll bless you in their face. Leave her alone. She's doing this against the day or preparing me for my burial. 
She knows I don't have long to go. She believes what the Bible says about me. She has insight that I'm not just a man. I'm the God man. I'm the one that sits high and looks low. I am God in the flesh, Emmanuel, God with us, Jesus, who will save his people from their sins. He said, listen, she knows who I am. And guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to take care of her. God will, talk back to him if you can now, take care of you. So he defends her. And then he says in verse eight, since you worried about the poor, look at the wisdom of this. Jesus takes his foolish, ignorant statement and with an economy of words, he turned that thing around. He said, since you worried about the poor, the poor you'll have with you always. Guess what? When I'm dead and gone, physically dead, but seated at the right hand of my father, there's going to be some poor people. As a matter of fact, you can help the poor people with the money you got right now. You see, Judas, I'm trying to let you know you ain't slick. You see, Jesus is trying to let us know we ain't slick. When we, when we lie, when we slide, when we hide, when we connive, when we cut corners and slash this and do that and try to put on a spiritual face, we ain't slick. Don't, don't, don't think. Don't see. Sometimes I believe people inadvertently believe they can pull the wool over God's eyes like you smarter than him, like you slicker than him. No, 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 you're not. Let me tell you something right now. No, you are not. They always thought they had him. They always thought they were smarter than him. But the foolishness, the Bible says, of God is still wiser than the wisest men. Who can be his counselor? Who can be his educator? Who can be the one that instructs God on how to get stuff done? You see, they don't do it that way in 2021, God. So you're going to have to amend what your Bible says to make it more palatable for the world. We're not slick. There's not, listen, he said the poor you're going to have with you always, which also brings with it, as I close, another striking implication. Everybody is not going to be rich. Lord have mercy. You keep lifting the T.D. Jakes and Creflo Dollar and, 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 and Lord, I wish I can get some more names. A whole bunch of these other folk. Every, it seems like the only ones who are rich are the ones who are telling you to sow into their ministry. Help me buy a private jet. And some people did it. Help this man, Kenneth Copeland. Lord have mercy. And I'm not trying to down these men, but I'm going to call a spade a spade. Everybody is not going to be rich. The poor you'll have with you always. We say, what is rich? Rich is not, listen, we can talk relative rich or we can talk rich, rich. Rich people don't go to work unless they want to. When the alarm clock goes off, a rich person can either roll over, go back to sleep, or they can roll out and go to work if they want to. Rich people don't have to finance cars. They buy cars. Rich people don't pay mortgage. They buy homes. And folks, I'm awesome. Well, the Bible say everybody's going to be, no, it don't. Don't tell me you're going to be rich and you can barely afford to co-pay on your insurance. Everybody won't be rich. Some people will be. Some people will. I thank God for the wealthy people who are Christians. I thank God for the entertainer, the athlete whose heart is given to God. And God blesses them tangibly with wealth and riches. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the Davids and the Abrahams and the Moses, the Solomons. Thank you for the wealthy people that love God. But guess what? There's some other folk that love God that won't ever own their own home. Everybody, the poor, you'll have with you always. He didn't make that statement just to get us to understand some of the heresy of today, although it does. He made that statement to slam the door in the lies of Judas. Judas, stop that nonsense. Stop that foolish talk, man, because you ain't fooling nobody. And here we can see that there is, as our lesson says, I get ready to close here. There's sorrow before triumph. We can see the difficulty comes before the blessing. The darkest hour is right before the day breaks. And so we can see here that Mary and Joseph had their situation. Judas, Jesus, and another Mary had their situation. Let me tell you something, people. In the end, God wins all the time. So I appreciate your time. We've made it to almost 1020. I appreciate your presence. 
uh, for the members of New Hebron, and I mean this sincerely, for any friend or guest that l wouldn't mind helping financially, we appreciate it, but you're certainly not obligated. I'm speaking to the members of this local church. Let's make sure that we honor the Lord and give God what he deserves to make sure that we can continue having the finances that we need as we go into 2022. And so I'm going to go ahead and close there. Actually, oh, Lord. Get my phone, too, while I'm sitting here running my mouth. Go ahead and send mine through right now, too. <laughs> I'm sitting here talking all this talk. Mm, Lord, I can't even spell it. There we go. Make sure I send mine while I'm talking. But nonetheless, let me say this to you people. I, I appreciate your time. Um, I appreciate your attendance. Make sure that you refill your coffee cups, as I'm going to do. And uh, we'll be back around 1040. Or so, we'll get started at 1045, but we'll be back in just a few short minutes, and we're going to continue with our sermon series entitled, stay with me now, The Hard Reality of Serving the Lord. Men, I got to talk to you today. Amen, somebody. We're talking to, the, the word is for everybody. God's word is for everyone. But I'm going to, I got something specific I need to say to our men today. It don't have to be men's day for that or father's day for that. So nonetheless, I pray that we get to see you in just a few short minutes. Go refill your coffee. Thank you for your participation and your support, at least with your presence. And I pray that we can have many of you, if not all of you, to come back and join us again. God bless you.